Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the August meeting of Renew. Um, our guest tonight, Peter Natros, is the sorry, is the technical specialist uh, sustainability with uh, Carbon Neutral Adelaide. And Carbon Neutral Adelaide was formed around three years ago with the goal of making Adelaide one of the world's first carbon neutral cities and uh, Renew, or the ATA as it was then, uh, was a founding, founding member. So Peter will explain a couple of the significant initiatives of the, the program, the, um, the Building Upgrade Finance Program and the Sustainability Incentive Scheme. So please welcome Peter. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, where, where's Steve gone? So, to walk in the door and have my bi uh, U12 biology teacher pass me his latest book. Now, that's something new. So, just plugging it. <laughs> um, all about cars, and tonight certainly incorporates some uh, material about cars. Um, so, the City of Adelaide uh, has a long history of in, uh, working to uh, mitigate its own carbon emissions. Uh, but also increasingly prepare for the impacts of climate change. Um, we've been uh, very fortunate as a, an administration to have very much a, a stable hand in the administration based on the science. Now, having the stability uh, to be able to do that means that we've been able to lift aspiration over time uh, to deliver meaningful change for our community. Um, and the more time that passes, the faster we have to move, but what's really exciting is to see uh, the technologies that are coming forward, but also the uh, entrepreneurial, is, uh, you know, entrepreneurial spirit of our community, um, the appetite for this change and the understanding of the urgency and the opportunity that comes with change. So that's a really good colour contrast. Hopefully it gets better from here. All right, so tonight I'm really going to focus upon two key areas. And the, those areas are the um, sustainability incentive scheme and also building upgrade finance. So to uh, support change, the City of Adelaide very much believes in uh, leading and then supporting others to follow. So it's, it's not all about just asking people to do it and hope for it. It's they understand within their own assets that they have to test it, share it, and incentivise others. And that's really important uh, because often it is not the first, the early adopter that is taking the greatest risk. It's that first follower who follows. Um, so yourselves, I know there's a few people here who have modifi modified their own vehicles uh, and taken uh, some big steps with their own housing, led professionally with housing design. It's Getting our community to follow, that's so important. So, you know, with the sustainability incentive scheme, uh, the City of Adelaide supports uh, our community to install sustainable technologies, to adopt good practices in the aim of reducing carbon emissions and leading to a more environmentally sustainable city. Significantly, uh, that is uh, a major economic enabler. That's how it's perceived, is to, to lead, is to uh, seek an opportunity in, in the face of uh, change, is actually to find the opportunity for our community. So between, uh, we, we had a, the sustainability incentive scheme was last updated in 2015. Prior to that, it was uh, pre-2010. I think there was a few changes in 2007 when it first was released, 2009. And it was very much focused upon issues of the day, such as rainwater tanks. We had this thing called a, a drought, um, permanent change. Um, so there were rainwater tanks and it was uh, air quality. There was issues that uh, the early incentive scheme addressed. But in 2015, we really changed the focus uh, and we shifted that focus onto electric vehicles, energy monitoring. Um, we had some solar already there. We just expanded the aspiration, reflected the need for commercial solar to move. Uh, and we also stepped into the world of energy storage. 
Now, energy storage was really important because the City of Adelaide was the first to offer an incentive for households and business, a financial incentive, a rebate. Now, what, they, what was really important about that incentive was we knew that all the governments around Australia were sitting on the edge waiting, going, oh, who's going to be first, what's going to happen? And there were uh, officers in those agencies who were wanting someone to step up and lead. Because they knew once one did it, they could then go into their manager's office and go, someone else has done it, let's do it. And that's exactly what happened. Energy storage, the phone rang hot. Uh, as soon as it was out released, we had um, ACT, New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland. We had people on the phone from state governments talking to a city council and saying, how'd you do it? What, what's, what's in it? Um, it made a difference. And, it's, and then that translates forward. We see the SA Home Battery Scheme. Uh, we see um, solar PV, you know, we've got a, a very good uptake going on, um, acceleration of those things, electric vehicle charges. So between 2015 and 2019, jointly funded with the Government of South Australia, uh, there is 505 applications approved um, and there's a million dollars goes out the door, but importantly it triggers our community will invest nearly $8.5 million. Right, so that's all activity, it's all car like economic activity, economic benefit, it's jobs, it's what politicians love, is it's utes and tradies and technology and local residents getting a real benefit. It's money in our residents' pockets because they were able to put the technologies in uh, and save that money. Um, and that's was really important because it built confidence and it built partnership with the state government. Just lost that and it's back up there. Um, so then we we uh, proceed to a review. Now, I'm going to colour in the dots. Are you able to change the contrast at all, mate, on that or? No? All right. Yeah, all right. So in here there's a series of dots. That's a purple dot. I promise you that's a purple dot. Well, this one's a bit better, but it's only 5% better. That's the city of Adelaide. I'm going to show you this one. And the HDMI cables got angry. So I won't linger on this long, but essentially what we found is a very good distribution of incentives across the city of Adelaide. As to be expected, we had the business community in the CBD picking up incentives that were relevant to them. Uh, but we also had, um, and that was big solar, so we had some big tall buildings, you can't see the solar, but if you go into certain taller buildings, you can see solar on roofs, five, uh, 50 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt, 150 kilowatt systems. We, we didn't have any of those systems, no one was going there. And it didn't matter how much money was involved, it meant that they had a trigger for a conversation with the building manager. It opened the door for the champion in that building to go in and say, someone's got some money, can we do it? Right? That gave them permission to ask. Uh, and then we see all through North Adelaide and we see in the, the, the all through the residential sections of the city, really good activity and not-for-profits picked up on it as well. So 505 applications, that were approved. There's not many that weren't approved, some that just didn't proceed because of the information not being given, uh, but very popular in the community. It's not proceeding. So in undertaking the review, we're looking at uh, what's occurred, so we, we get to the end of uh, the, uh, this, the scheme in terms of needing to do our review of it. Uh, and so we're looking at what's happening out there. Where does this incentive scheme need to go? Noting that the 2015 incentive scheme was really focused upon early adopters. So we looked at bell curves of adoption to inform us as to where we wanted to get. So we had the early innovators, the early adopters and the early mass market. And so the incentive scheme is really pitching to support the innovators, and then to move to the early adopters. So there's probably plenty of people in this room who, like myself, paid a lot for solar. Um, you know, there's people who've bought electric cars, modified, 
you pay more than we, where we know those technologies are going to end up. That's the group of people that the incentive scheme is really trying to work with. And so the incentive scheme was trying, the review wanted to stay true to that group. So you'll see that in how the percentages of what the rebates pay. Like there's a pretty consistent 50%. Because right, you take a technology risk and a financial risk when you adopt a technology early. So it's, it seems reasonable for a government to share that risk with you. And then for us to share that knowledge with our community. So to take that cost alone is not really a reasonable um, expectation is what we're working on. So we see Energy Story SA Home Battery Scheme introduced. Um, doesn't cover businesses. So there's a gap. Electrification of transport. Momentum building. Cost still high. We see solar PV is driving electricity duck curves, which I'll get to in a minute, and many of you are probably aware of what they are. Um, and, and solar PV, there's barriers for apartments and uh, tenants and concession households. And then there's this thing called virtual power plants. It's all flavour de jour with energy storage, virtual linked devices. The community's aware of it and there's new tech coming. So there's, there's somewhere where the incentive scheme can move to that adds value and, and works with those people who are really putting their sticking their neck out to lead change, to learn, to share, uh, to make a difference um, in what they're doing. So we'll just step through some of these trends. So we had the... Uh, Energy storage, we've touched on that. There's still a need for the City of Adelaide to support commercial uh, installations of energy storage. It's still only $5,000. It's not a lot of money in the scheme of how big a battery system needs to be for a commercial enterprise, but it's still a, it is something that at least can support them in their, their, their conversation, but also it's something that can go towards, you know, if they're having to get a consultant in to help them design something. It's some money on the table. And every, every, every cent helps when you're trying to pull a business case together. Um, but importantly with the, the electrification of transport is this global mega trend. And um, so some of you may be familiar with Tony Sieber, who's a, a very prominent speaker in the area of disruption. Um, you know, so what we've got, and you even hear you know, CEOs and the like of Mercedes-Benz talk about autonomous, connected, shared electric mobility. And that disruption in the automotive sector really, uh, you know, uh, disruption occurs really when global megatrends merge. Right, so the technology can be sitting out there, but it's when it actually comes together is when magic happens. And so at the moment, these are sort of moving in a, a related but not fully connected way. Um, but at some stage, just like the smartphone, I look together because the price will be right and the tech will be matured and someone will know how to deliver it. And we have some names that we don't need to mention that might get there first and others might get there soon after. So where we get interested in the city of Adelaide is car parks, public car parks. The city of Adelaide has a very high off-street parking ratio globally to jobs and other activities. It may not seem like it, but it is. It's very high ratios. And when you look at it, these are just just the multi-deck car parks that in your mind you can see that have been constructed over the last 40 or 50 years. And there's 26,500 or over 26,500 public bays. And when you look at the City of Adelaide's multi-storey office buildings, 1.3 million square metres the Property Council says is rated, 1.3 million square metres. Our records show there's probably two million square metres of office, but there's over 700,000 square metres of just multi-deck car park. We've been chasing energy efficiency in office buildings, and we've been doing it nationally with the City of Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, with a program called City Switch. Energy efficiency in office buildings is pretty tricky, 
because if you want to change the lights and do work, you have to decant your staff, uh, the, the, you know, the tenants and work around them. And car parks are potentially another opportunity because it's just a concrete shell with lights that are on long periods of time. There's lots of opportunities there, but there's also change are coming. So when we look at uh, transport as a percentage of the city's emissions, it's rising. So the City of Adelaide uh, Council Operations, we seek to be carbon neutral council operations by 2020. Uh, it's been the objective of the City of Adelaide since 2007. And so we're working through the process now to get that National Carbon Offset Standard certification. Um, but when we look at our community emissions, we've gone from 17% to 27%. Now that is in a large part because of renewable energy in South Australia as a percentage in the grid's gone through the roof. So that means that the buildings are naturally getting less carbon intensive. So naturally the transport, which hasn't got the same rate of change because we're not changing the fuel, has become entrenched. Um, and so we've got to do something material to change that. And that's where those that trend comes in, is in transport, in electrification. So we see that 76% of the vehicle journeys that we're measuring are light vehicles. That segment is seems very much ready to be uh, transitioned across to electric vehicles. We see Volkswagen with 50%, projecting 50% of their sales by 2025 will be electric. We've got Toyota, finally coming forward with you know, meaningful plans with large percentages of their vehicles will be electrified. So we need to support our community in that area. So the City of Adelaide strategic plan, which we're reaching the end of the current one, but back in 2016, you know, it was provide a range of incentives for the use of electric and low emissions vehicles. So the incentive scheme, the, that, that gave us license to put these sorts of things up. But it also gave us the basis we needed to build 40 uh, electric vehicle charging stations. Importantly, the City of Adelaide is the second largest owner of off-street multi-deck car parks. So rather than demonise the car, the objective is to decarbonise the car. It's a major revenue stream for council, but we've got some excellent people in, in that, that business who get the need to shift their business and, and target. So. We've, we've put these uh, charges in. Oops, there we go. So that's uh, former Lord Mayor with the CEO of the Electric Vehicle Council at the launch of the Tritium Charger in Franklin Street. Um, so we partnered with a range of um, companies, South Australian and national and international. So Nielsen, um, were the contractor for our off-street and we had um, SA Power Networks to do the on-street work for us. Now, there's a real good reason why we uh, worked with, for example, SA Power Networks because electric vehicle charging stations pull a lot of power really quick and we live in a state with a l big demand charges, very peaky demand because of air conditioning loads. So working with SA Power Networks was important because we need to be able to have a conversation about the tariffs for electric vehicle charging stations, those network tariffs, because it's a, it's a controllable load. All right? we, they, don't, they shouldn't have to reserve a massive capacity in the network so that you know, we can, they can, you know, people can charge on them um, infrequently, you know, like unpredictably, um, because they can offer a lot of grid services. So that's been where the values come with SA Power Networks. Uh, they can see our into our charges and they can control our charges. That whatever the network around them, um, they might be able to turn it up or turn it down based upon the no local network conditions. Um, so it's about uh, strengthening uh, our relationships with industry to give value as well. So then we look at the you know drivers for uh, electric, uh, so renewable energy in the grid, the duck curve. This is what makes the state government tick. Duck curves. <laughs> Absolutely, because this is the exciting thing about our grid. It's where it's headed to. 
and this is where economic opportunities prevail, I suppose. It's, let's get this to go, can't see it, magic. So what you can see here is the duck curve, is that we had the last slide, that worked, is that the, this was in 2011, this is the demand profile for electricity in South Australia. And you can see uh, here is the lowest point and we can see that's sort of four o'clock in the morning. So that's over here, four o'clock. So this is, you know, midnight, uh, all the hot water services are on and, uh, and then here we, we get that lowest point in the market. And here in the is the mornings where everyone turns their kettle on. It's just up here. Everyone turns their kettle on uh, and then they go to work and then we've got the, the business load kicks in uh, and then we have air conditioners and then we all finish watching TV, go to bed and then on comes hot water services. That's what it used to look like and many of you will be familiar with where it's gone to and that's in this poor contrasted use of yellow. It's hollowed out. So the state, SA Power Networks, everyone is trying to find stuff to put in the middle of the day. So with your electric vehicle charges at the moment, um, you, can, you can have, uh, you know, you can charge in the middle of the day now and get off peak in the middle of the day. So I went through the process myself, got my meter changed, and uh, yes, I can get half price electricity to charge my car in the middle of the day. It's great. What's that, sorry? Diamond, yep. Uh, but it's a process. I'd, even though I put solar in in 2008 or nine, and it was a smart meter, and SA Power Network said, yep, your meter works, could do exactly that, because it has a controlled load on it. Because of power choice legislation, I had to change the meter anyway, which is like, <laughs> so it was, the meter could do everything functionally, but they still had to change the meter. People were great, SA Power Networks got it, my retailer got it, um, but it was quite a process, you know, over 12 months ago to go through that uh, and navigate it. But through that, I learnt as to what the process would be for our residents. Um, now, then when we look at uh, solar PV, barriers for solar PV, rental, low-income housing and apartment households, we hear that publicly and certainly the uh, the, all the work that we do, the work with uh, interstate councils, there's certainly a lot of people that are feeling that they uh, are locked out from getting solar on their houses. So the so City of Adelaide uh, followed um, interstate examples and we did Solar Savers Adelaide. And there was, we went to an expression of interest, so significant community interest in Solar Savers uh, to participate um, so Solar Savers Adelaide essentially was the City of Adelaide would buy the solar PV system, install it on the property, basically sign it over to the household, and then using an existing section of the Local Government Act, we'd put a charge on that property and recover the cost over 10 years. All right, so the council paid that money up front. Um, and so massive interest in that. And a lot of the interest, half of the interest actually, from memory, was from apartments. A lot of landlords and a lot of uh, tenants as well, but a lot of apartment people who wanted solar, but how do you divide up the roof of an apartment building? Um, how do you, you know, spread the cost? So it's, it certainly is an issue, and so the incentive scheme, we um, kept our eye on how we could, you know, do something that could assist so we, we put in 40 solar PV systems uh, and that was uh, cooler cosy, so Tindo panels uh, and um, uh, you know, they're installed and they've been operating now for over a year and a bit. Um, but we got learnings out of that, so as I mentioned earlier, repaid through the rates. The outstanding issue that we, because we were unable to, we were unable to resolve this issue of apartment buildings because of the complexity of the corporate governance within buildings and putting in a contract and repayments. Um, 
we couldn't deal with it there and then. So, but we parked it. We knew we have to come back to it. And um, so the opportunity there is shared solar, which is technology enabled. All right, so we'll, we'll touch on that soon. But you and slide. <laughs> um, so again, we've got this trend of virtual uh, vehicle to grid and virtual power plants. Um, and what we can see is, is that out of the interest that's there with batteries, like people understand a, a virtual power plant of batteries linked up and responding into the grid. Um, but there's all of these devices that are within the house that are controllable, that can be turned on and off. And increasingly so, we're going to see more and more devices that can be remotely controlled to determine when electricity is used. Turned on earlier, turned on later, call, call more, call less. It's, it really is an area where there's uh, a lot of uh, brain power and, um, and business dollars being moved into this. Um, and so it's how this household works is really where we're interested, is how does, what's, what's the opportunity for our, our households in our community? H what support, what multi-point support can we provide to assist them to take that technology up? For them to be able to firstly control devices and get off-peak power, and then secondly to be able to use their, uh, their say, electric vehicles in a single direction just to charge, but also then to get it to bi-directional, to bring power back into their households. So we then look at what the incentive schemes that Council has approved. So there's your usual solar hot water, which is uh, was a bit of a legacy from the last incentive scheme. Um, it's not enormously popular within our community, but it's still a really uh, important source of solar energy. Um, but what we've introduced is, um, with this was from 2015, um, uh, we had a 50% to 500 for a smart controller. Basically, if your solar is exporting to the grid, it detects it and can control your, hot w your resistant element hot water service to uh, turn on. Um, so that's been around for a little while, so we just need to promote that a bit more. Um, and then, you know, the, the other legacy item that we've got is the rainwater tanks, which we just upped some values to support the community because there's, again, uh, quite a shortage of rainfall, uh, except for the last couple of days. But, um, yeah, so we've got the basics in place. We then look at the big change areas. So the big change areas really um, is to we s need to stay and continue to support commercial uh, premises. Um, commercial premises are putting in the bigger size systems and the incentives being maintained for that section of the community because they have to uh, work together and get all those permissions and consents and there's additional costs with cranes and working at heights. So there's justification to continue to support commercial premises to put solar in. Shared solar. So what we introduced was a new, ca new category into the incentive scheme, which is around shared solar. Because there's some really good virtual metering products uh, that are uh, coming to market, uh, being piloted at scale. Uh, so the scheme is positioning to support apartment owners to be able to look at embedded networks, but also um, virtual, um, virtual schemes within their buildings. Now, we still will be defining the criteria around that, but the council's uh, supported uh, providing an incentive up to twenty thousand dollars, where it's with a, a you know a, a greater than twenty kilowatt system. The critical thing there they want to see, because a lot of PV goes into bu buildings, uh, multi-storey buildings, and it typically goes to the common areas, the solar. So it's netted off of the uh, common area. So the key thing that we are see wanting to see in that shared solar incentive is we want to see the governance and the the rules and systems around distribution of that solar to the household, to the tenant. Uh, that's the key difference that we, we're wanting to see happen. Um, and now that will mean that's the technology. The key piece of tech we want is the system that enables that to occur and the governance structures around it to make sure it gets done. 
uh, energy efficiency in apartments, buildings, we've had that in place. We just simplified it so it was uh, a lot str a lot easier for apartments. So that's per year. 20% uh, up to $5,000 per year. Getting, again, it helps people to have that conversation with their body corporate to make sure their sinking fund is spending the money to keep their building improving. And there's some exciting work that's going on in the city uh, with uh, a few apartment buildings in that area. Electric vehicle charges. We had uh, unidirectional, so single direction charging incentives uh, from 2015, but now we move into the world of bi-directional. Uh, we lift the thresholds to reflect technology that it used to be um, 20 kilowatt charges, so it's now 50 kilowatts, which reflects where DC charging, faster charges are going. So we now are offering up to $5,000. So this is where you see some 50% starting coming through. 50% up to $5,000 per dedicated bay, basically. So the city of Adelaide, we put 30 electric vehicle charges into our car parks. We're now wanting others to follow. Uh, we put in single direction just charges and we're working with fleets to be able to support them. But we actually want disruption um, and we want innovation and entrepreneurialism around business models and applications for customers to participate. Peak pricing event coming in the national electricity market, are you in? I'm in. $14,500 a megawatt hour versus 100. So we want to engage with the trader mindset. We want to engage with the executive who's got that um, potentially, let's say it's a, it doesn't excite if you, uh, <laughs> they might have a Nissan Leaf, but in terms of it's, it's, you know, or a Mitsubishi Outlander or one of these cars like we see Vol uh, Volkswagen is headed into potentially this area as well. I, I restrain myself from saying Tesla because they don't seem to want to get into bi-directional. Uh, <laughs> so um, the, like this, we want to m create economic opportunity for car park owners. New revenue streams. Sell when the price is low, buy it back, share the, share the benefits, selling it back to the grid when the price is high. All right? Buy low, sell it high. Just a trader mindset. All right? But importantly, where this really links in, this one here, is that the City of Adelaide, our council area that was on the invisible slide, has tier one energy security. Our lights go out last. So when the lights went out September that fateful time and I was sitting in an office and the lights went black and I looked out the window at other buildings, I instantly knew there was something not right. All right, is our lights go out last. All right, so we, when you look at it from an entrepreneur and a business, is when Brighton's being blacked out because of power shortages and other suburbs are being rotated around, the City of Adelaide's lights are still on. So when you've got 26,500 plus off-street car parking bays that could have vehicles parked in them that are early adopters of electric vehicles, why couldn't they be pushing power into the grid to keep someone else's lights on? Because they'll be handsomely rewarded for that. They might stay, for example, and spend some more money in the city at a, at a shop or go to a, an event like the uh, Fringe. So there's lots of value streams for the city of Adelaide if we can have our car parks as part of that battery and leveraging that energy security. What we need is the entrepreneurs. What we need is the ideas and the money that will make it happen. And I can assure you, just like when energy storage incentive was pushed out the door, people have come knocking because they can see that and they can they that was the idea is it creates an incentive that is sufficient enough like these bi-directional charges are about uh, twenty thousand dollars a go at the moment but we have very good reason to believe that they will come down to more in that ten thousand dollar range noting that you can get a very good uh, single directional charge of sort of fifteen hundred dollars installed or the like um in the picture that I had up there before that you couldn't see, there was actually a, ch a charger that Ewan uh, w had put in the picture. Uh, that I think you might be looking at, Ewan, but it's a bi-directional. Um, you know, so there's, there's products. We can see these products coming. We see these charges, these bi-directional, and we can see that price coming down 
but we just want to incentivize to get them to come to Adelaide. Absolutely. So it's a vehicle to grid. So charge it and then it can bring it one way and it can also push it back. All right. So e-bikes. Don't forget cycling. You know, if you look to China, e-bikes, electric bikes are huge. And what's really important, the city of Adelaide um, uh, has a cycling infrastructure and end of trip facilities that, you know, they've been contentious but they've done it. Cycling is a major area of uh, electrification, huge in China. Um, and when you look at how it extends range and it's good for well-being, um, you know, people can ride further, they can deal with our, our little limited slopes. Uh, E-bikes, so we provide incentives for electric uh, bikes as well. Um, it's not complex tech, it's just a PowerPoint with a sign and a rail, but often it's just what people need to get it out the door. Here's the important bit is demand management. <laughs> if you don't want to, you know, overload, pay too much network charges, what we are making sure that we're incentivising is the smarts that go behind those charges, that get the charges to all work together, based upon your SA Power Network's agreed maximum demand, um, or can respond to an external signal from the market to, to actually trade to work with uh, charges that might be remote to, remote to that location. So, you know, it's uh, a simple system, just a basic one that can make four or more charges work within SA Power Networks. Agreed demand is 25% to $1,000. The City of Adelaide, our charges, so we've got 11 22 kilowatt three-phase charges in each car park. It pulls it could potentially pull a lot of juice having um, uh, 11 22 kilowatt charges under the same roof. It's all got Schneider Power Monitoring software that controls it and turns it down based upon the SA Power Network's agreed demand. And it prioritises the base building and the tenants over the charges. Uh, because there's no money in electric vehicle charging if all your money goes to pay the network. But there's an opportunity that sits between your agreed maximum demand and your normal demand. Uh, and you have these occasional spikes that you have to pay for in the network, but they're rare. And you can either manage those spikes with energy storage and uh, technology change, or you can seek to establish a new revenue stream within it. You can moderate those peaks, but then you can s put an electric vehicle charging service in there as well. And you can turn them all up and down to make money in that area. You don't have to pay SA Power Networks anymore, you just have to manage the load. So then the area that uh, comes in is, um, yeah, how does the customer interact with it? Right, so that's what we're talking with people about, is how do we get the customer to control or opt in or opt out of these events if there's money to be made? Um, but managing that demand is critical uh, to not blow the bills. We then have, at a household level, I said about that sort of smart house and uh, in the grid is we work very closely with SA Power Networks to offer 50% up to $500 to do the wiring to put your, you know, your floor heating, your electric vehicle, your pumps, your controlled loads that are eligible, any approved appliance um, is to redirect it in your board uh, to be able to uh, control those loads and between 11 and 3 I think it is get that off peak power now. Um, so that's where we can engage with our community. Um, and move them towards this, like I said earlier, the duck curve is loading appliances into the middle of the day is really going to be an important part of that 100% renewables grid, is putting those appliances in and then it comes down to who will control that load. Um, commercial energy storage, as I mentioned, it can fit into this, this equation. So I mentioned that the virtual house earlier and I touched on that the car park. So you can see here where we're really interested is in these car parks because we've got, we've got 700,000 square metres of car parks and when we look at it, there's six key owner operators that control the majority of that market. They need to work out how they will respond 
to electrification of transport. Auto or, uh, autonomous. So with that trend coming, how does how does billions of dollars of assets in the city of Adelaide respond? Is it a do nothing? Is it a risk management? Do a little bit? Is it you know totally sell it? Keep the asset, sell the trading business. There's decisions that will need to be made uh, by that that sector of the community that that owns and operates these assets, and the city of Adelaide wants to support that decision making, as do others. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, so when we chase energy efficiency, carbon reduction, energy, and you know, reducing operating costs with our, our city our property owners and tenants, um, you know, office is still committed to office energy efficiency, uh, but car parks with a model of solar on the roof, LED with daylight harvesting throughout for their lighting, electric vehicle chargers with demand management, including battery storage. There's a suite of products and technologies that all work together really nicely, and they all exist. It's how they work together that's the key. And when we look at skills export capability, that's what the world will want to buy, is to make this hum need some special smarts and some tech that makes it all work. So, yeah. Cities like Manchester are like Adelaide. They've got a lot of car parking and they own a lot of car parks themselves. So there's certain, certainly some very interested parties out there in the work that the City of Adelaide's doing. But we need to support our community to move on it. Because the, what we find is that the barrier, if we talk to the fleet managers, is that the operators go, you want me to put in an electric vehicle charger? No. So if the car park owners that control the majority of the market don't put the charges in, the fleets don't buy the car because they're already worried about residual value. So we can we what the City of Adelaide's incentive scheme is looking at doing is what can we manage, what can we provide support for? And that's where you saw earlier the um, the solar, the batteries, the charges and the demand management software. Uh, there's multiple points there where it can actually provide a, a suite of uh, support. As well as that, this the incentive scheme provides pre-installation commitment agreements of up to two years. So for a new development, it's up to two years, where we'll actually pre-commit the money, which then enables them to get the consents, develop the, the final details up. So that gives certainty of that, that money as well. Often rebates are in, you know, in arrears and you've got no certainty in it, you know, that gets a bit problematic. Um, the incentive scheme is designed to support that development phase. And importantly, what it is as a trigger that is around getting you to actually go ahead with it as well. So you, to activate the incentive, you actually need to pay a deposit. It's only 10%, but that gets that gets the project started, which gives the the developer, like the engineer, the like, the certainty that you've, you know, you're going to proceed with a contract. Um, so, when you look at who's going to, who buys these cars, why are we so interested in fleets? So, business and government and rental fleets accounted for 52 percent of all passenger vehicle sales in 2017. Fleets are really important in the second-hand market. That's where most of us will buy our first electric vehicle. Um, and when you look at that approximately 10% or just over 2,500 of those bays are permanent reserve customers, so customers who have a contract with a car park on a rolling basis. So they've got an existing relationship. They, so there's two parties there, potentially three, the, the vehicle owner, the car park operator and potentially the car park owner. So we're needing a, a few people to make a decision that they're going to go ahead with it. So we really need to work with that group and the incentive schemes designed to help that. Um, and so when you crunch the numbers on potential fleet demand, you know, fl we based upon this 52% uh, of new sales being by these groups, 25% of, um, if 25% if of that number there, the 2,600, if 25% of those vehicles are electrified by 2025, then we need, you know, 666 bays electrified. When we get down to a high scenario of 
we've got just under 2,000. So noting there's only 40 plus a couple of Tesla destination charges in the city of Adelaide, there's a fair bit of build that's needed to support electric cars in the city. So how do you, when you look at that we can give, you know, 20, 30, 40,000, you know, in a, you know, a bundled agreement, that's, that's not going to pay a lot of the way, but it gets a seat at the table. What the City of Adelaide had worked with um, for several years was we supported the state government uh, to get building upgrade finance uh, established in South Australia. So th the incentive scheme is, is a grant, basically. We, we rebate, we give cash, and it's out of ca uh, council's taxation system. It's council in its annual budget allocating money. This is commercial finance. All right, so this is a com uh, conventional finance uh, provider like a bank, but the council becomes a third party to an agreement. There's some r really important features of this. So this, this is where we start to get into s big dollars potentially for supporting um, uh, private owners of buildings, car parks, um, wineries. This is statewide that this is available. Um, is that yeah, traditionally with a, a mortgage you would have a financier and a building owner. If you give me some money, I need you to give me some money for, to undertake these works. Okay, sign some papers. It's two, two entities that would deal with it. That building owner has the debt against them. And when they sell that property, they have to pr put the proceeds to pay off that debt. By council, so this is under the Local Government Act, was amended, um, which is based upon Victorian legislation and New South Wales legislation. Um, and so the City of Adelaide worked uh, with the state to um, for them to amend the legislation, which actually brings a councils in. So the councils elect to make it available in their council area. So you've got uh, private money, uh, you've got the building owner that undertakes to do the work, but the council comes in to collect the money, pass it through. Now, where this is really important is it gives... Uh, the council's involvement is merely to pass money through, but it gives the landowner some specific advantages with this finance. As I mentioned earlier, normal finance, sell the building, pass the money, pay the debt out. With this finance, the debt is against the land. Right? So if you take a million dollars to upgrade a car park, um, then the, a million dollars uh, is registered against the land. It can be transferred between owners. Right, so it, it overcome it basically the, the business case of an, an energy efficiency upgrade. You can transfer the business case from owner to owner. That's the key. So the councils can get involved and we're just a very light touch involvement to facilitate the transfer of money. Um, and we declare a charge on the property like the, incent uh, like the uh, solar savers. Uh, we declare a charge on the property and we recover that money quarterly and remit it back to the financier. Not much involved by us, but significant advantage for the building owner um, and for the financier. Um, because for the building owner, they can get 100% of the, d the upgrade costs, when normally they might only get 50%. But they can then also work um, to be able to transfer that through. So when you look, think about a disrupted car park or, or an office building, they can, recon they can reposition that building, reposition the asset, um, and then they can sell the improved asset if they're seeking of exiting, the, exiting it. One of the barriers for commercial building owners is they don't know how long they're going to hold the asset for. Um, they think, well, I don't have a five-year timeline, time horizon. I, I may not be owning it. I might not hold it in two years. If the price is right, I'll sell it. So building upgrade finance actually enables us to talk with them about upgrade it and then you can look at uh, passing that cost through. By agreement, you can trade it, uh, transfer it by agreement. Uh, also though, it overcomes uh, an issue which is called, uh, where the, uh, it's called split incentive, where the landlord undertakes the work, but all the financial benefit goes to the tenant. So the tenant gets the energy efficiency benefits of lower running costs, not the landlord who's put all the money up to do the work. So with 
with building upgrade finance actually enables the landlord and the tenant to share that cost between them basically based upon savings that have been realised through that upgrade. And there's protections in there for tenants of no worse off. So they c the landlord can only pass through to the tenant what's actually the saving. The areas, uh, again we look at, so this is at scale where, where our money can't even touch the edges, um, is solar, energy storage, end of trip facilities, electric vehicle charging, uh, air conditioning upgrades, uh, environmental compliance, if you've got wastewater problems, it just has to improve the environmental performance of that building. Um, so councils normally in a, in a, this is where we've been looking at what the role is of building upgrade finance further. So we've got the incentive scheme over here which is just a direct cash injection. But people will typically want to deal with the council as a last resort, particularly when there's finance involved and they've already got their suite of lenders. So building finance is building upgrade finance is really looking at key niche areas where the existing finance industry is not operating. So that's the ability to pass debt through, to pass on uh, some of the cost to tenants. But we think heritage as well. Our legislation is different nationally because the South Australian legislation actually enables building upgrade finance to be offered to heritage properties for conservation works uh, and heritage and uh, access upgrades. Now there's a, a really important mindset that exists with heritage buildings is there's an um, opportunity there because you're the custodian of that building. All right, so you, you hold it for a period of time but it's an enduring building and so building upgrade finance, the ability to pass to upgrade a building and pass the benefits and the costs from one owner to the next has real potential for impact investors, for example, who see a building and they want to make a difference. All right, so they'll upgrade that building and get the tenants in and they can then sell it to someone who wants a heritage building, understands uh, as custodian of our heritage, um, that it's been repositioned, they've de-risked it in some way for us as well. So upgrade finance allows that. So you can see the council's looking at it from all angles. So they can, through heritage, um, the building upgrade finance, you can finance the environmental works, you can uh, finance the upgrade works, you can f finance the conservation works, all with a conventional lender where they normally wouldn't be able to do it. So when we look at carbon neutral Adelaide, heritage buildings are a massive part of our enduring fabric of our city. It's got um, embedded emissions within the fabric and many, many people perceive it as having a disadvantage, that they, they can't upgrade it. They now get, now get an, up an advantage because they can get access to finance that others can't get access to, to do the conservation works that keeps it uh, waterproof, um, upgrades, lifts, uh, these sorts of things. So I suppose that's the key from the City of Adelaide is that change needs to be supported, that technologies, there's risks of being early adopters and there's a financial cost of being an early adopter. And that the City of Adelaide really values those early adopters and the storytelling that goes with it. Uh, and that has a significant value beyond the City of Adelaide because it enables the first followers. It enables entrepreneurs to really look at an opportunity and, and share that risk. It enables businesses to share that capital risk of setting up and adjusting to a transition. So ideas matter. Um, adoption, early adopters are critical to our strategy. Passion, there's a lot of passionate people in this room I'm sure and you understand that mindset. Um, and that is really what the incentive scheme is tapping into, is to support those who make our cities different, who make cities great, who start that move and allow others to follow. And it's making sure that those early adopters don't do that in isolation and take all the hit for that cost, all that effort, when those who follow get a significant benefit for that leadership. So the incentive scheme is, is actually hand in hand with the community to support that magic to happen. 
uh, and then building upgrade finance is to then scale that up and get the private finance sector involved and that's statewide that this is available we just with facilitating a rollout statewide with the government um, but certainly in the city of Adelaide with uh, car parks funding that package of works uh, to uh, there's incentives that can come in then there's enduring finance people can reposition those assets uh, to respond to that autonomous connected shared electric mobility future uh, it's supporting that change de-risking it enabling a person to reposition a car park and sell it if they so desire building upgrade finance can do that so it's selling a de-risked asset that is better for our community so prior to that those building upgrade finance being out there that wasn't possible so there's there's a lot of consideration that goes into what the city of adelaide's doing and the benefits hopefully flow out from the city to others by us sharing our stories and that's, I suppose, why I'm here tonight, <laughs> is to help people to understand, you know, the, the, um, the, com the complexity of, w I suppose, what we're trying to navigate, to weave that in. It looks like some dollars, uh, but there's actually an ecosystem of support there. Uh, and that's where the conversations are at, is with industry and with households about choose from the list, bring it together, and it can really make a difference.